Okay, so there's three of them up here to do. The first one, gear ratio. How many teeth are in the big gear? 15, and in the little gear? There are nine in the little gear. Which one's going to go on top? The nine. It's the driven over the driving. So the one that's connected to power, in this case connected to the motor, goes on bottom. And of course that will reduce to a 3 to 5 ratio. Now over here I asked two different questions about this. What's the pitch? Height over span, which would be 8 over 24. This is a one-third pitch. Is that? Slope is 8 over 12. Rise over run. The run is only half the span. There are all sorts of ratios that are going to come up when we're dealing with mechanical things. We saw pulley ratios, compression ratios. Um, also, a big deal is going to be the rates, as we talked about, your feed rates and stuff like that, RPMs, all rates. So what we want to look at today is some applications of these and how do we work with them. So let's say that we require that 3 to 5 gear ratio. Now again, it might be written like that or it might be written like this. Either way, they mean the same thing. We require a 3 to 5 gear ratio. We have a motor that has a gear with 45 teeth on it. How many teeth do we need on the other gear? So let's set up that gear ratio of 3 to 5. How do we find the missing amount? Well, first of all, which one of these numbers, the 3 or the 5, represents the teeth on the motor? The 5. That is the driving number. And the motor is the driving gear. So the other is the 3. So that means is over here on the other side, the 45 teeth for the motor has to go on bottom. Because that's... The, driven, the driving gear. So what we're looking for is this number on top. We looked at these proportions like this a little bit last semester when we talked about percents. I want to talk a little bit more about how they work now since we've done solving equations. We talked about cross, multiply, and divide to find missing numbers in here. And that is actually just a shortcut. If I am going to solve this for x. What has been done to x here? x is right here. What's keeping x from being alone on that side of the equation? It's been divided by the 45. So to solve it, to take it apart, we would have to multiply by 45. That would make that go away. Multiplying by 45 over here well, how is that going to be set up? Well, that's going to be 3 fifths times 45 over 1. And what's going to happen is we're going to multiply 3 times 45. So it's going to be divided by the 5 on bottom. So that process of cross multiplying and dividing, 3 times 45 divided by 5, is just a shortcut of solving the equation because we know we're going to multiply by this number. And when we do our fraction multiplication, it's going to be the numerator of the fraction multiplying that number. It's just saving some steps. In fact, another consequence of that is this. We could multiply, we could get rid of the fractions completely. If we multiply by 45 here, that gets rid of that fraction, right? Cancels out. We could multiply by 5 over here to get rid of that fraction, couldn't we? 
So what's happening essentially is we got 3 times 45 on this side, x times 5 on that side. What this is call, called is just plain cross multiplying. You have 3 fifths equals x over 45. The cross products, 3 times 45, which is 135 has to equal the other cross product, 5 times x, which is 5x. So 5x equals 135. You solve it by dividing by 5. x equals 27. But again, all those things I just showed you do lead back to cross multiply and divide. 3 times 45 divided by 5. Or 45 divided by 5 and then times 3. Whichever order you want to do it in works out. What about when uh, it's on top? Like if we have something like this. Same thing. Here's our missing number. This is the direction that we have both numbers. We're going to cross multiply that way. 2 times 21 is 42. Yeah, but like equation wise, like solving the equation, not that way. Oh, God. You mean solving the equation? Okay. Yeah. Well, to solve an equation with a variable on bottom, we have to get the variable off the bottom of a fraction. So I'd multiply by y here. We're going to cancel that out. Multiply by y here, right? Multiply by 2 here to cancel that out. Multiply by 2 here. So it's still 7 times y equals 21 times 2. 7 times y equals 21 times 2. So it still does work out the same. We know it just looks very different. The reason I'm showing you all of what I just did, even though with just the numbers, it comes down to simply cross multiplying and dividing, is because it's not always that simple. Because we sometimes run into things like this. Now it's not just the variable by itself here. We have a couple of options. <coughs> we can do 7 times 36 divided by 42, which is going to give us what? Six, right? Problem is, does x equal six? No, this equals six. Two x equals six. So we'd still have to solve for x. That was pretty simple. You divide by two. X equals three. I find that students make a lot of mistakes if they try to do it that way. Most of the time, we're better off if we do it the long way here. 2x times 42 is 84x. 7 times 36 is 252. So we know the two cross products must be equal. 84x must equal 252, and we solve for x by dividing by, two, by 3. So what are we going to divide by? 84. Thank you. The answer would be 3. Just solving the equation, that works too, yep. <coughs> You might run into <sighs> something like this. It can be the same type of thing. You just solve the equation, that works. Or you can do 
15 times 18 is 270. This product's a little more difficult. I'm going to put the number first. 27 times 3x plus 1. 27 times 3x is 81x. 27 times 1 is positive 27. So now you've got the equation 81x plus 27 equals 270. And we solve it from there. Subtract 27. 81x equals 243. Divide by 81. It can be. Um, if you're going to use it just by solving the equation, you end up basically going through the same steps. You're going to multiply both sides by 15, right? You're going to multiply both sides by 27 to get rid of that. Now you're at the exact same spot here. You've got 27 times the 3x plus 1 equals 18 times 5 is 270. 18 times 15 is 270. So in pretty much the same spot. Don't oh. oh, I got you. 18 times 15 divided by 27 is 10, so then you got 3x plus 1 equals 10, and that works too. The key is just making sure you keep that straight. And what happens is a lot of times students will take a shortcut. Where more of the mistakes get made are in problems that look like this. So students will do this. 7 times 30 is 210. Divided by 21 is 10. Subtract 3 is 7. What did I just do wrong there? Well, the 10 is right. But it's x minus 3 equals 10. I don't subtract 3. I have to add 3 to get back to x. And that's where I see most of the mistakes get made if you do it that way. If you're going to do it that way where you cross, multiply, and divide, write it out as x minus 3 equals that number, equals 10, and then solve the equation. In your notes, try to find x in that one for me. Which way would you do this? Cross, you cross multiply like that? I would cross multiply. I would do 5 times 24 is 120. Then here you've got 8 times the 2x minus 3. So then 8 times 2x minus 3 equals 120. Distribute the 8. So 16x minus 24 equals 120, and then solve from there. Well, some people from this step would divide by 8 instead of distributing the 8. So you get the 2x minus 3 equals 15, which is I'm sure what you're, where you're going when you cross multiply. I don't cross multiply at all. Okay. I just solved the equation. Yeah, 5 times 24 is 120 divided by 8 is 15. And you're getting 2x minus 3 equals 15. And that is that is fine if that works for you. I've just found in the past a lot of students have a hard time keeping straight what they need to do when they do it that way. So yeah, and that's, to be honest, if I were doing this without doing it in front of a class, what I would do is I would do 5 times 24 is 120, divided by 8 is 15. So this equals 15. So that saves me dealing with the large numbers. Okay, either way, you're going to come up with 16x equals 144 divided by 16. X is 9. 
crap. Well, the problem is you run into ones like this. Give that one a shot, Craig. So when you see one like this, you're right. You have no choice but to cross multiply. X times X is X squared. 9 times 4 is 36. Square root, okay. So the square root of x squared is x. The square root of 36 is 6 or negative 6. Now in real life, the negative usually isn't the right answer. But if we don't have a situation that we're dealing with here, we have to consider that as a possibility. When we square root, there's always a negative possibility. I'm going to try this one in your notes. Okay, so this one again is one that can really only be handled by cross multiplying. So going in this direction, it's 11 times the 3x plus 1. In this direction, it's 8 times the 4x minus 2. So 8 times, it doesn't matter which one we put first. We're going to have to distribute for both. So 8 times 4x minus 2 is 32x minus 16. 11 times the 3x plus 1 is 33x plus 11. Where do we go from there? We have to get rid of one of the x's. Which one are we going to get rid of? 32 is a little bit smaller. So here we've got negative 16 equals neg 33 minus 32 is 1x, or just x. And then subtract 11. 11. Negative 27 equals x. <coughs> Where are we going to use proportions the most for you guys. Oh, well, could you go along with the numbers on bottom? Yep, you're right. I forgot about that. One like this? Yeah. So now you do the same thing. If you wanted to do it your way, you do 35 times 21 divided by 15, right? Well, I'm solving for the equation. Yep, so that's 5x minus 1 equals 49 is what you're going to get there, right? So how do I, how do I get rid of Because you do 35 times 21 is okay, yeah. 735 divided by 15 is 49. So, so far. To isolate the 5x minus 1 here, yeah. you do have to cross multiply to get that out of there. Okay. So you have to do, these two are multiplied, you divide by this, and that's what the equation equals. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's, how I, that's the only way you can get that equation by itself. Well, I'm going to show you a little trick here. Any proportion can be flipped over, as long as you flip both sides. So I can take this proportion, and I can turn it into this. And now doing it your way is a lot easier to do. Now, yes, you just multiply by the 35, multiply by the 15, and go from there. Yeah, if you're going to do it your way, that's the easiest way to do it, is just flip it over. Just remember now the meaning of the numbers is flipped, too. You know, what, what used to be meant on top is now on bottom dealing with a real situation. <coughs> okay, so where does this come into effect for you guys? Well, the, the proportions with just ratios the biggest effect for that is going to be in similar figures. 
So we can take a triangle. I'm going to cheat. And enlarge it. Now, if the sides of this original triangle here, let's say that this is 10, 12, oops, can't write today. Ten, twelve, and twenty inches in length. Let's say over here, I'm gonna mark these two angles as the same and these two angles as the same. We have to do that because we have to know which angles are the same in order to know which sides correspond. Corresponding sides are between equal angles. So then if I tell you that this side here becomes 30 inches. I know that this side corresponds to this side because they're between the same two angles. Over here, what corresponds to this side? From the other, the 10. Very good. So that corresponds to the 10. This side here corresponds with 12, the only one left. To set up a proportion to find the missing side of similar figures. We first have to know the lengths, the numbers for two sides that correspond. And here we have the 20 and the 30. It does not matter whether we set it up as 20 over 30 or 30 over 20. What does matter is once we've done that, how we set up the second ratio. So 20 corresponds to 30. Let's say I'm going to try to find side X. Do I put X on top or bottom over here? It goes on bottom because it's from the same figure as the 30. So that everything from that figure has to go together. What goes above the X? The 10. Because that's the side from the other figure that corresponds to the X. So now we can cross, multiply, and divide. 30 times 10 divided by 20 gives us 15. So X is 15 inches. Now the 20... 20 corresponding to 30 still is going to apply. We can still use that for the next side. Where does Y go, top or bottom? That still goes on bottom because it's still from the same figure as the 30. Above it is going to be the 12. Because the 12 is the side that corresponds to the Y. So we've got 30 times 12 divided by 20, which is going to give us what? Y is 18 inches. So similar figures, the easiest way to think of similar figures is one is an enlargement or a reduction of the other. It's the same figure, it's just been shrunk or it's been enlarged. The technical way you tell that two sim figures are similar is by what we just did here, looking at the angles. For example, this triangle here and this triangle here, they're not in the same orientation. How can we tell for sure that they're similar? Well, if I tell you that this angle and this angle are the same, if I tell you that this angle and this angle are the same, that's two out of the three. Now in triangles, all the, the angles of a triangle have to add up to 180 degrees. So if we know that two of them are equal, the third one must be equal. So even though it's not indicated, that third angle must be equal to the third angle of the other triangle. So now if I tell you that this side here is... 30 millimeters, and this side here is 75 millimeters. Say I tell you that this side here is 24 millimeters. If 
call that side x. We'll call this side y. <coughs> oh, shoot, what do I want to make that one? Let's make this one 25 millimeters. Find x and y. Well, first, let's match up the sides that correspond. What side from the other triangle corresponds to y? 24. Because they're both between the single hash angle and the unmarked angle. What side from the other triangle corresponds to the 25? x. Again, between the double slash angle and the non-marked angle. And the 75 matches up with... 30. So we can see from right there we have a pair where we know both measurements. Which pair is that? 30 and 75. Doesn't matter which one goes on top. Now we talked about reducing ratios. You could reduce this ratio if you wanted to. You divide both of those by 5 and make it 15 over 6 if you wanted to, which would make the calculation a lot easier. So now, which one do you want to find first, X or Y? X. Okay, is X going to go on top or bottom? It goes on bottom because it is from the same triangle as the 30. What goes above the X? Its corresponding side is the 25. So we will cross multiply and divide. 30 times 25 divided by 75. X equals 10. You can do 30 over 75 equals x over 25. Yep. Yeah, 30 over 75 equals x over 25 instead of, yep. That's great. Now to find y, where's y going to go, top or bottom? Y is with the 75, so that goes on top. What goes with the y? 24 is the corresponding side from the other triangle. So we are going to cross, multiply, and divide. 75 times 24 divided by 30 is 60, right? Y is 60 millimeters. <coughs> and at where this application comes in a lot for you guys is blueprint reading. Uh, let's say you have a one-eighth scale. Now depending on what type of blueprint reading you're doing, for mechanical blueprint reading, a one-eighth scale usually means one-eighth of an inch equals one inch. What scale do you guys typically use? Do you know? One to one. Okay. For some of your smaller parts, a one to one is, is typical. If this were architectural, a one-eighth scale means one-eighth of an inch equals one foot instead of one-eighth of an inch equals one inch. So anyway, let's see, you've got a figure that is drawn. And this is two and a half inches. What's the actual size? Well, you've got one-eighth of an inch equals one inch. Which one of those is the drawn dimension? The smaller one is the drawn. One eighth is the drawn, the one is the actual. So over here, where's the two and a half inches go? Two and a half is the drawn. Okay? Because the one eighth represents the drawing, the one represents the actual. So to find the actual length, it's 1 times 2 and a half divided by 1 eighth. So 1 times 2 and a half divided by 1 eighth is what, 20 inches. So the actual length of that piece is 20 inches. It can go the other way. You can have a... Usually they'll do it this. Usually they rate your scale as to one. A 
two inch to one inch scale. So now what they're doing is if you're, you're making a fairly small part, they're enlarging the drawing so you can see the details easier. So this one, if it is drawn at four and a half inches on the drawing, this is a two to one scale. The two is still the drawing. So the four and a half goes on top. You are going to cross multiply. One times four and a half divided by two. This is a two and a quarter inch is the actual length of that part. This is we're talking blueprint reading. I'm going to just do one example of an architectural. Let's say you had an architectural drawing where it's one eighth inch equals one foot. And you have something that is drawn at six inches long. You want to find its actual size. Am I going to do one eighth over one? No. I'm going to do one eighth over 12. Remember, a ratio is always representing two things with the same units. One foot is 12 inches. The six inches is still my drawn. So I'm going to cross, multiply, and divide. 12 times six inches divided by one eighth. is 576 inches. So the actual length there is 576 inches, otherwise known as 48 feet. So you do have to be aware of units when you're dealing with scales. <coughs> As we switch over to metric, it's most likely going to be a one to one, a one millimeter equals one centimeter or a one-tenth scale, which you're most likely going to be seeing if you have any sort of an adjustment at all. What if we have a rate point zero zero four inches per revolution? You guys see, look familiar? What type of rate is that? The feed rate, right? The tool can advance four thousandths of an inch into the material for every revolution. You're saying that the blades on the material, now I'm not accounting for blades. I know you guys use a formula where you account for whether it's a two blade or a three blade tool, number of cutting surfaces. Um, I'm not accounting for that here. I'm just saying each revolution is four thousandths of an inch. And I want to know. How many revolutions to go two tenths of an inch? Well, we had mentioned before that a lot of our rates hide the fraction in the units. 0 0.004 inches or four thousandths of an inch per revolution is really four thousandths of an inch over one revolution. So now we're going to put the point zero or the point two is going to go where? Top or bottom? Well that's inches so it better go on top of the other inches, right? So the bottom here is going to be giving us revolutions. So we'll cross multiply and divide. One times point two is point two. Divided by 0 0.004 is what, 500? That's not right. 50. So it takes 50 revolutions of that tool to advance. Now we'll actually look at converting that into time later. For right now, we're going to leave it at this. I gave you guys a packet yesterday. In that packet. We're going to continue with pages 228 to 229.
problems 17 through 45. If you just want to do the odds, that's fine. You got that packet, right? 17 through 45 on page 228, 229. 